Last week we opened up our sermon series, The Promise of Christmas, by exploring Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. And we reflected on the hope that we have in Jesus. Jesus being the light of the world, he transforms darkness into light and guides us toward a peace. And that peace results in salvation. In Isaiah's prophecy, it reminds us that even in the midst of uncertainty and despair, God promises never fail. Jesus is our hope. Jesus sustains us. Jesus strengthens us. Even when the world feels heavy, Jesus is there to comfort us. And see, in this message, it resonates with truth that Christ's coming wasn't just an historical event, but what it was, it was a personal gift of hope to all of us. Now this morning, we turn to Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14, and we see this hope, it manifests itself in peace. God's greatest gift often arise and arrive in unexpected ways. And what we realize too as we study scripture that these gifts are delivered to the most unlikely people. We see heaven interrupt the ordinary lives of humble shepherds with this extraordinary news and the shepherds themselves who were ordinary men were going about their lives and living daily and get this, they being shepherds were chosen to receive the good news of great joy. A Savior has been born. And what we must understand is that the birth of Jesus marks the arrival of true peace. Not just for the shepherds, but for us. And their encounter with the angels reminds us that peace itself It brings Christ, and as it brings Christ, it is not dependent on any circumstances, but it is rooted in his presence. Some people don't have peace because they don't have Jesus. And some people don't have Jesus because they don't want peace. You want peace, but you won't submit to the God of peace. See, true peace is not the absence of trouble. True peace is the presence of Jesus. And this morning, as as we'll unpack how Jesus' arrival brings peace to those who are wearied and, and in this world that is heavy, what we'll see is that as we live in peace, we'll be able to share it with other because Jesus is the reason for peace. Amen? Amen. The big idea this morning for our text is this. The advent of Christ, the dawn of peace for every, for a weary world inviting us to live in that peace and to share it with others. I think last week I used an example of that when you get a good deal, you like to share. If you get your hookup, you like to share. And I think I used an example last week of, you know, two cent ribs. And I think we would all be excited about those two cent ribs. But those two cent ribs were gotten from somebody's trunk. And I was, I ain't gonna say I was, but you know, somebody could be excited about receiving two cent ribs. And anytime you get good news, what happens is that you call and you tell somebody about it, right? Sometimes you get bad news, you tell everybody too. But you know, when you get good news, you call and tell everybody about it. And this is the reason for the season that we're in. This is the reason for hope is that Jesus Himself is the reason that we have peace. Jesus is the reason 
that peace exists on earth. In the text of verses 8 and 9, the scripture reads, In the same region, shepherds were staying out in the field and keeping watch at night over the flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. God's peace and hope are revealed in the most unexpected individuals. <laughs> And what it does, it demonstrates that this peace and this message is for everyone. Now, to give you an historical context, the shepherds were those who were socially marginalized. They were viewed as dishonest and they were ceremonial and clean by religious elite, by the religious elite. And because of this, their words were often uh, believed or deemed as untrustworthy. They were excluded from all the religious practices despite their, their lowly status. I, I want you to see in the text that God chose them to be the first recipients of the good news of Jesus' birth. And God's decision to reveal this news to the shepherd, it, it emphasizes that peace and hope are not reserved only for the elite. But it is offered to common folk. I would say it this way, it is offered to all humanity. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 27 says it this way, but God had chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. I would share with you this way. God's good news isn't reserved for the worthy. It's revealed to the willing. Uh, let me say that one more time. God's good news isn't reserved for the worthy. It is revealed to the willing. Uh, the question I have to ask you this morning, and I feel like preaching this morning, are you willing? And have you been willing? Willing? And if you've not, if you have, a, have not had a heart of willingness, I would share with you, get on your knees and repent. Mm, Jesus, Jesus. We serve a living God. Yes. And a living God that doesn't play games. Come on, I don't know who is for in here this morning, but God does not play games. Be careful who you play with when it comes to God. And I mean be careful of playing with God because God won't play with you. It's not like someone that we see with our own eyes. We serve a God who is omnipotent, who's omniscient, and who's omnipresent. And one of the things we have to do specifically as we deal with this text, we need to challenge our assumptions about who God chooses. God could be choosing you, but you could be rejecting God. And I'm not just saying let your yes be yes. What I'm saying is let your yes be always yes, not sometimes yes. And see what God does here in this particular point in time, we see this encounter that God's good news, get this, is for everyone. Regardless of their status, regardless of their background, God desires and wants to have a relationship with you. Hallelujah. If I were to ask you to rank your relationship with God on a scale of one to ten, <laughs> how would you rank it? Don't say it out loud. But search your heart. How would you rank your relationship with God? And truly be authentic because from this day forward, what I'm going to ask is that God himself reveal himself to you on the level that you're at. To get you to go where you need to go. Sometimes God has removed certain things from us in order to get us. Believe me, I've been there. Done that and I've got the t-shirt of it. Don't like wearing it. I burned it. <laughs> what we see in the text, especially in verse 9, we see the angel's sudden presence. And what we see in their presence, we see that it is 
glory of the Lord. It, and what it does, it signifies this manifestation of God's majesty and his holiness. And, and the glory often symbolizes God's presence among his people. And see, unlike any other angelic visits, this angel is not named but serves as God's messenger to announce the birth of Christ. The shepherds, they have this reaction of, of fear and they describe as, as they are terrified. They are in this, they are reflecting this overwhelming awe, this great fear. This, it's often associated with divine encounters. When you study your Bible and when people interact with angels, especially men, what do they do? They're afraid. And fear is both natural and it acknowledges the unworthiness to be in the presence of God. Mm. When you come to God, do you come fearful? I'm talking about reverent, not fearful and scared. But do you treat God with an honor and a respect and a, a worthiness? And I'm not just talking about, you know, when you pray. I'm talking about in every aspect of life that God has called you to. Do you honor him with fear and reverence? Mm, Jesus. Or do you treat him like a part-time lover? Ouch. You can't say amen. You got to say ouch. Sunday's good enough for me. What about Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday? Saturday, love. Some of y'all didn't get that song, but that's all right. Some of y'all may not be old enough for it. We got it. Too young. Yeah, they're too young. <laughs> Still got strings on their chin for the men, you know. But are you willing? Does God glory affect you? Have you been in the presence of God this year? Jesus. Have you been awestruck? Have you just laid down on your face? Have you just been in the manifestation of God's glory per, in your personal time? And if you haven't, and you're a part of Grace Bible Fellowship Church, shame on you. Theology is not good enough. There's orthopraxy and orthodoxy. And see, in orthopraxy, we practice the presence of God. Maybe I should ask you after church, how do you practice the presence of God? Or do you practice the presence of God? Or do you practice the presence of yourself? <laughs> and see, this is what I want you to realize. The gospel is for everyone. And everyone is for the gospel as long as they believe. We are to experience God's glory. Share with you this way. God's glory overwhelm us. But his grace draws us close. How do you respond in those moments when God's presence feels overwhelming? Or do you even know what that feels like? Have you ever walked into a room, room into a room starstruck? And didn't know what to say. Jesus. Have you ever been so sensitive to God's spirit that you would walk in all loosey-goosey, but then you, you get the atmosphere and then you straighten up quick because you're trying to get whatever God has given? That's, it. That's the manifestation of who he is. And does that same spirit draw you in closer or does that same spirit want, have you want to be removed because of sin in your life? Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 tells us this way. Let us then approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. God chose these shepherds and these shepherds were despised and they were overlooked by their society and their community. But get this, they were the first ones to hear the news 
of Jesus' birth. And the choice reflects the heart of the gospel. Is that peace and hope are for everyone. It is not based on your merit or what you do, because what you do, get this, you don't do enough. How many of you believe that you do more than enough for God? Can't say amen, gotta say ouch. You don't do enough. But God himself, he gives us the assurance of his peace. And his peace is enough for those who love him. And it reminds us of the message of the gospel that it is meant to draw us closer together. In verses 10 and 11, the text read, but the angel said to them, don't be afraid. For look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the city of David, a Savior was born for you who is the Messiah, the Lord. The peace proclaimed by the angels is not absent of conflict, but the presence of the living Savior, Jesus Christ. And see, what we must understand is that this type of peace is rooted in the hope of salvation and the reconciliation with God, bringing great joy to those who believe. The word good news refers to the gospel. It is the announcement of salvation through Jesus Christ. And the angel's proclamation contrasts sharply with the common fear associated with the angelic appearance. Sometime when that angelic appearance took place, it was often tied to divine judgment. And the gospel itself is exactly about salvation. And what it does, it shows us God's redemptive plan is now being fulfilled. We see this in Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7. And the text reads, How beautiful are the mountains are the feet of the herald who proclaim peace, who bring news of good things, who proclaim salvation. This good news is the source of great joy for those who are seeking salvation and reconciliation to God. And for those who are uninterested in being right with God, it serves as a warning. John 15 verse 11 says it this way, I told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. The message itself, when it talks about the people, it is referring to Israel. But in Luke's gospel and the and Acts, it emphasizes this universal nature of salvation through Christ, including the Gentiles. And what we see is that sometimes people are afraid. What are you afraid of today? You afraid of letting somebody down? You afraid of not being able to accomplish what God has put you on this earth to accomplish? Afraid of not being the best father, not being the best mother, not being the best husband, not being the best wife, not being the best brother, not being the best sister. What are you afraid of? And see, what we must realize, when we love Jesus, there is nothing to be afraid of. And that's what the gospel does. You got family members sick? It may tax on you, but you're not afraid because you know that your God, our God, is what? In control. And we disappoint ourselves because we get afraid of stuff that we don't even know that's going to happen. And that's what fear is, right? Fear is what? False evidence appearing real. And most of us worry about stuff, get this, 
that don't even come to fruition. And we've taken that time to worry and to be afraid. And I, I would share this with you. Fear fades when the good news of Jesus fills your heart. I love saying I ain't scared. I can be concerned, but I ain't scared. Now, now, there's a difference, right? You know the difference between being concerned and not scared, right? And see, in Jesus, I ain't scared. I may be concerned, but I know even in my, my, my willingness to be concerned, even though I may not want to be, God himself has it all in control. And he does this. He puts us to rest about our concern, and especially when it comes with peace, because we start to realize that we are sinners and we now have peace with God. What spurred Paul to preach the gospel was that he was afraid that his countrymen and those who were around him would fall into the hand of a living God. So it spurred him to teach the truth. It spurs me to treat, teach the truth. When I see lack of, lackadaisical effort and this, this sense of uncommon concern, it tells me the spiritual nature of the church. Please listen to please please listen to my heart because this is all about peace. This is all about restoration, and you gotta be peace at peace with God before God can move. I, I want God peace. I want His peace to consume us. But sometimes there are things in the church that limit God's peace, and I've gotten old enough to say, God, remove it. If I got to stand, I'll stand by myself. We are called to be in a place where God himself understand and we understand that Jesus' birth fulfills the Old Testament prophecy of the Messiah and his connection to the lineage of David and Bethlehem. And that fear goes away because it is now historical fact. In Micah chapter 5, verse 2, Micah prophesies and he says, Bethlehem, Ephratah, you are small among the clan of Judah. One will come from you who will be ruler over Israel for me. Jesus is just not a baby in Bethlehem. He's the Savior. <clears throat> He's the Messiah. He's the Lord. And what he does, he fulfills promises and he offers this reconciliation. And the angels themselves, they identify the child with, with three key titles. They identify him as a savior, the one who delivers from sin. They identify him as the Messiah or the Christ, the anointed one. And he fulfills the Jewish expectations of a deliverer. And the angels identify him as Lord. And this Lord signifies Jesus' divine authority. And what it does, it, it's linking Jesus to the Lord of the Old Testament. In Titus chapter 2, verse 13, it says, Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. When you think about Savior, what do you need to be saved from? You see, Jesus isn't just a Savior. Jesus is your Savior. And this is what we must realize. And, and how does Jesus being your Savior transforms your understanding of his role in your life? You see, when we take something serious, 
But we are serious about the business, right? Come on, I'm talking, right? Amen. When you take anything serious, if, if your boss says, don't, if you're not here by 8 a.m., you will be terminated. What do you do? 745. 745, right? <laughs> if you don't pay this bill at certain certain time, your services will be terminated. When do you pay that bill? The day before, right? <laughs> I think about it, right? When it comes to your salvation. Come on, Pastor. Come on. When it comes to your submissiveness, your submission and your submittedness to Christ, mm. how does it, how do you get serious about serving Jesus? Mm. My fear is that there is a promotion of lackadaisical effort. Jesus says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Jesus says in Revelation, get this. I would rather you be hot or cold. Lukewarm, I'm going to do what? <laughs> Some scripture says vomit. This is why the gospel is for all people. It's for all people because all people need to hear the gospel. Amen. And not just hear the gospel, it's to live the gospel. It's to act like the gospel. In other words, it's to be born again with God's Holy Spirit. It is to put forth an effort to say that I am spirit-filled and therefore I am set apart. And my concern, let me just talk to my church. My concern is that some of us, not all of us, are going to bust hell wide open with our eyes wide shut. Mm. Preach, Pastor, preach. Right. Can't say amen, got to say ouch. My concern is your salvation. Not your membership. Come on, come on. Not your attendance. We just got finished studying Hebrews. Where it says they have tasted the goodness of God and denied the power thereof. There is no Plans, there is no worthy for them to be saved. And it's not that they were ever saved. It's just that they were hung around saved folks. Because just because you hang around saved folks don't mean that you're saved. Please listen to me. And share this message. 2025 coming around and we don't know who's going to make it through 2025. Amen. Can't say amen. Got to say ouch. I've seen people who I thought would live forever drop just like that. And I've seen people who should drop like that live forever. They must be got vinegar in their blood, huh? We're called to treat Jesus as our Savior, mm. not our homeboy. Come on. And if, if God gives me anything, my, my prayer is that he would give me those who are solid, who are filled with his spirit, who are serious about their walk, who are concerned about the Savior, and who are doing everything that they can to live according to his plan and purpose. And this was the message, and this was the announcement. There was an invitation. And this peace that would be with God through this Savior, Jesus. And as he has this title, Savior, Messiah, Lord, it reminds us that Jesus is uniquely equipped to rescue, to lead, and to reign over our lives. And this is the good news.
This is the good news of the gospel. Verses 12 to 14. Text read, this will be the sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in the manger. Suddenly, there was a multitude of heavenly hosts with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people he favors. God provides this sign of reassurance to humanity of his faithfulness. And what we see is that we understand this first sign as ordinary, a baby that is wrapped in strips of cloth. And what we see, it demonstrates that Jesus, though divine, shared fully our humanity. John chapter 1 verse 14 says it this way, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the second ordinary, extraordinary sign is that the Savior was lying in the manger. In other words, it was an animal's feeding trough. And this is a stark contrast to the expected grandeur of a king's birth. And what it shows us is that it reflects his Jesus' humility and his accessibility to all. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, Paul writes, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, for your sake he became poor so that in his poverty you might become rich. I like the way that sounds. I want to make sure you hear the gravity of that. I need you to make sure you understand the scripture, what the scripture is saying. He says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich. For your sake, he became poor. So that by his poverty, you might become rich. What is this saying? I want you to dig deep. I want you to hold deep to your heart. I want you to really understand what it's saying. Jesus is all that in the bag of chips. And you ain't none of it. But what he did, he became none of it. So that you would become all that in the bag of chips. You see the contrast there? You see what peace does in your life? It's that you ain't got to have it all. You ain't got to be it all. You ain't got to work it all. And it's that Jesus himself, he does the work and says, now you have it. He swaps roles. You know, some of us got some well-to-do friends, right? And some well-to-do friends we don't like to hang out with because what do they like to do? They like to brag about what they got. They like to flaunt. They like to show it, right? But just imagine that friend saying, you know, because I want to be your friend, I'm willing to give it all up and give it to you so that you would be my friend. And now we're on the same level. And see, this is what Jesus does. Jesus gives us a sign. And see, God's sign don't showcase his power. They reveal his heart. When God manifests his goodness to you, it it not only shows his power, but it reveals his heart towards you. And see, what happens is that God has given us some unique gifts, and we've taken those gifts and we've tossed them away like a toddler. We don't value them. How has the birth of Jesus caused you to be humble? And how do you live and how do you serve others? I need you to think about this. I need you to to, to marinate. How do you you live your life for Jesus and how do you serve others? Well, I made it here on Sunday. Can I tell you something? That ain't enough. 
You don't know what I went through that week. I don't have to know. You're still alive. You ain't dead. You better be glad that I ain't God. I ain't saying I was going to kill anybody, but I'm saying that you're going to get a good shock. I'll call down some lightning quick. Well, what happened? Why your hand burnt up? Oh, well, pastor called down some lightning. And truth be told, we need to evaluate. Yes, yes, yes. We need to go into a season of evaluation. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. How are we serving the Lord? And what are we doing to glorify Him and to make Him known? Some of us are so after life. But do you realize that the life you have? It's for the God that has given you life. I started earlier by asking you, would you rank yourself? Don't tell me about it. Would you, would you, would you rank yourself in regards to what your status and how you have lived for God? And today could be a new day. The day could be a new start. God is faithful. And just like he's given signs to shepherds, God fulfills his promises. And what we see that the heavenly holds, it refers to the an army of angels and it is not coming to battle, but it, it's proclaiming peace and praise. Psalms chapter 148 verse, 12, verse 2 says this, Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly armies. This is the proper response to God's redemptive work. And as we respond to God's redemptive work, we're called to joyfully praise. How many of us are in here joyfully praise the Lord? I woke up this morning and I just put on some of my hymns and just started singing and praising and showering and shaving and, and, and just thanking God. Thanking God for you. Thanking God for what he's getting ready to do. Thanking God that he is now equipping me with those folks and he's given me a keen eye of discernment. And the keen eye of discernment concerns me. Because sometimes that can be a prophetic voice that God allows me to see. And I'm like, God, what to do with that? What do I do with that? Do I pray or do I intervene? Do I warn or do I just sit back and wait? Do I speak on it? Or do I keep quiet? If I know you're getting ready to run into a fiery building and not say nothing, whose guilt is that on? On me, right? And this is why it's so important. We are to rejoice. We are to praise. When heaven rejoices, the world should listen. We see from one perspective a twofold praise. First, we got to realize how can we share Jesus like the angels did? Do you live a life where people would look at, man, I, 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 yeah, something's different about this person. I, I want to get to know them. And what you realize by you being a part of God's kingdom is not really getting to know you, it's getting to know the God that dwells inside of you that you mark your life by. And if, if your conversation is not marked by holiness, if your conversation is not marked by the graciousness of God, and I'm not saying that you gotta be like the, 
some of them folks preaching the Bible on the street corner. But if your life is not marked by people asking, hey, man, what church you go to? Hey, man, can you pray for me? Hey, man, um, you know, I'm having these troubles in my life. It's not you. It's that God is using you as a divine conduit to get the gospel out. And the gospel message is the gospel of peace. We are to praise him. And there's a twofold praise. Glory to God in the highest. The angels glorify God. And they glorify God who resides in heaven. And why are they glorifying God? They are glorifying God for his redemption plan. Jesus was just born. Peace is now on earth. Literally and figuratively. And Jesus' birth demonstrates the fullness of God's love and his sovereignty. In 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 11, it says, Yours, Lord, is the greatest and the power and the glory and the splendor and the majesty for everything in heaven and on earth belongs to you. This peace is not merely the absence of conflict, but the fullness of salvation and reconciliation with God. And this reconciliation is offered to those who receive his favor and his, his favor is rooted in grace. In Romans chapter five, verse one, it says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God's favor is an expression of his grace. And it's not about your human efforts. It's not about work. I, I will share with you this way. Peace isn't earned. It's gifted by grace. Let me talk to you this morning. Don't that feel good? You can't earn peace. But it's gifted by God. Where do you need the peace of Christ to rule in your heart and your relationship? Have you ever thought of that? Some of us may not be able to sleep at night because we're so wired. Oh, how am I going to get this? You're not going to get it. God's going to get it. Go to sleep. I need to go hustle. I, I got to go. I mean, I got to get this gear. I need to go do this. I need to pick up this. I need to go do that. You, you're going to run yourself ragged and still be miserable at the end. Then when you're all worn out, you want to ask God, God, can you help me? I told you to go to sleep five years ago. <laughs> you hard head. <laughs> but I'll let you do it. How do we actively share Christ with those around us in this season? Mm. The angel reminds us that Jesus' birth was, was a cause for this joyful worship and celebration mm -hmm. and this peace is found in salvation and reconciliation with God. Jesus is his gift of grace to us. How do we finish this? How do we help ourselves understand what this is about? What is peace about? God's sign to the shepherds were was humble. It was humbling to them, but it was profound at the same time. And the angels of the Lord song revealed the magnitude of God's redemptive plan. The peace Jesus brings is not superficial. It's rooted in hope. The hope of salvation and reconciliation with God. Just like the shepherds, we're called to witness and share the good news. How many of you can share the good news of Jesus Christ? Have you shared it? 
or has life got you so distracted with your issues, you haven't shared Jesus. You know one day you're going to have to give an account for that, right? I think about it all the time that I go to a gym and I speak to somebody and I build a relationship. I'm like, Lord, is it, is it time yet? Is it time? Is it time for me to... You're going to hell. You're going to burn. Is it time for me to, hey, invite this person over? Have you worked in their heart enough? Have they seen your life? Have they evaluated the way you live? Jesus was among them, but he was not one of them. We live among people and we're one of them. And we're among them. But at the same time, we want to put Jesus on them. Jesus is not cool. Jesus is God. You track with me? Amen. Jesus is God. Yeah. And if you have God, you have peace. And you have peace, you have the peace that surpasses all understanding. And how can you be a messenger of God's peace? How can you bring hope and salvation to others in your daily lives? Sometimes you may not even know how to find peace in your life. So I'm going to help you this morning. How do we find peace in Christ? How do we find peace in Christ? Get three points of application and then we're done. Peace isn't about where you stand in life. It's about who stands with you. We all should be saying amen. Amen. Not where you stand and who stands with you. Peace isn't the absence of trouble. It's the presence of Jesus. Peace isn't something that you achieve. It's someone you receive. The birth of Christ is the revival of hope and peace in a weary world. It's a peace that surpasses all of our understanding. And this peace is not dependent on our circumstances, but it is grounded in the presence of Jesus. Just like the shepherds received and they shared this good news, we're invited to do the same. Our world is chaotic. Would you agree? Amen. It's probably chaotic for some of you coming here this morning. Some of you probably didn't want to come, but you had to come. Not because somebody told you, but because the Holy Spirit drug you. <laughs> Let me talk to you. That shows the affection, affection that he has for you. You feel like quitting and giving up. Like, no, nah, come on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make circumstances work where you show up anyway. Yeah. We live in a chaotic world. We need to live as people of peace. We are to reflect the hope that we found in Christ around us. Where do you need to invite Christ, peace into your life? How can you be a messenger of peace this week? Finally, celebrate the arrival of hope by worshiping the one who brings peace. Isaiah 26 and 3 says again, you will keep the mind that is dependent on you in perfect peace for it is trusting in you. Father, we are thankful that you've allowed us to come together this morning. Yes. And as we go forth this week, Lord, we pray that the peace of Christ would guide our hearts, our minds, and our spirits. Let his presence be calming in our chaos. Let joy be 
turn to this aspect of grateful hope. And Father, help us walk in peace so that we would see and hear and act out what you have in store for our lives. We thank you, we praise you, and we love you. Until we meet again, Father, I just ask that you would have a peace upon our lives that surpasses all understanding. We thank you, we praise you, we love you. In Jesus' mighty name, we all say amen. Amen, amen family.